is a uh, you know, lack of information. And, uh, and, and there's lots of things you can die from. You don't want to die from ignorance. And I don't mean ignorance on the behalf of the patient. But some of these, top, some of these issues are fairly subtle. And an informed patient uh, makes for, for really good care. So I, I think it's important. We're going to try to communicate some, some important messages. I got started on this journey because of two patients that I met. And I just want to tell you their story very briefly. And I presented this uh, in Washington, D.C. earlier uh, this year. Uh, but these were two women who were virtually identical in terms of their background. Um, both the women were in their 70s. They were both doing well, living independently. Um, they had some health issues in the past, but generally doing uh, quite well. And, um, but they both uh, came down with a heart valve condition. And unfortunately, they, they took sort of divergent pathways. Uh, the first uh, patient, she was, uh, re saw her doctor, reported her symptoms, had a timely evaluation um, and timely treatment and did very well. And uh, she was in and out of the hospital in 48 hours. She's alive and well and enjoying her, her grandkids. And, and from, a, from, a, from a cost perspective, meaning you know what Medicare or insurance, this was $50,000 to get this lady treated. And so that is, um, so you know that's pretty good use of resources. Obviously the, the numbers are pretty high, but. But this is a real meaningful benefit from treatment. The other lady, she presented through the emergency department, had the same condition, um, but for a variety of reasons, uh, did not have a follow-up appointment and, and really was, had some delay in her therapy. And unfortunately, then she was admitted to the hospital uh, some months later in congestive heart failure and developed multi-system organ failure, which is exactly what it sounds like. And, and she, she died. And, and that was after a couple of weeks in the ICU. Never had a chance to get treated. And you know this cost the government or whomever's, whomever pays these bills a half a million dollars for a terrible outcome. So this, is, this really struck me because these two people were otherwise identical but for the pathway they took through the healthcare system. So this has uh, become sort of a, a passion of mine to, to try to close that gap, to try to make sure that everybody's informed on this topic and that people are, uh, you know, get the therapy that they need at the time that they need it. So just to switch back a little bit to, to talk specifically about mitral valve disease, there was in uh, uh, 2005 in the New England Journal of Medicine, for us that's, you know, that's uh, um, somewhat a gospel, although not everything in there is accurate, but, but the New England Journal is really the highest tier medical journal uh, in our country. And back in 2005, Dr. Serrano with Dr. Tajik, both people I've worked with in the past, uh, published an, uh, some very interesting research about what happens when your mitral valve leaks and, and what is the impact of that. So when, uh, and I'm gonna show you some anatomical pictures and we're gonna talk a little, there's a little bit of technical stuff here, there's also some video, there might be some blood, um, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get to that in a bit. But these guys, these, these gentlemen, they published the impact of what happens when your valve leaks a little bit, what happens when it leaks moderately, and what happens when it leaks severely. And I can show you on this slide, this, is a, this shows you survival, right? So there's a couple of these graphs. You have to uh, you know, put up with that to get to the movie part. But this, this graph shows, uh, and now my battery's dead. Well, that just worked a minute ago. So what you can see on this is this is a survival curve. So on the, on the um, x-axis is, is years going out to five years. On the y-axis is survival. And the top line is survival if you just have a mild leak in your valve. And you can see that five years out, if you just have a mild leak in your valve, that the survival rate is, you know, it's 90% or so. Um, and, and those people, obviously, people succumb to other things. However, uh, in, in this... Um, particular evaluation, if they had a mild leak, most people were still alive at five years. But you can see the, dot, the dotted line or dashed line, and that is a survival if you have a moderate leak in your valve, and then if your valve is leaking severely, again, untreated, you can see the survival drops way off, and at five years, is, hovers around 60%. So it matters how bad your valve leaks, and it has a direct impact on your risk of death uh, it, it, even at uh, five years. 
what happens if you treat that? Well, here's a, here is a, um, two graphs. I'm just going to show you these, and I know sometimes these are hard to understand. But there are two graphs here. They're both survival curves again. These are 10 years out. And then again on the y-axis is survival. And what this shows is that these, these, the difference between these two graphs are patients on the left who have symptoms. These are the people who say, I can't breathe, I have no energy. They go to their doc and they complain and they've got this severe leak. On the left hand, or, I'm sorry, on your right, that, those are the patients with the exact same condition but they're not having any symptom. I'm, I'm sorry. Those are the patients, right, who, who are not having any symptoms and who've had treatment. And so what happens is these, uh, when you treat patients who have uh, early in the phase of their disease, mild or no symptoms, the survival returns to normal. So that's a big deal, right? So uh, it, it becomes very important now that patients with a severe leak in their valve even if they don't have symptoms, if they want to have a normal life expectancy, need to have an intervention. And you say, well, why, why wouldn't anybody do that? Why doesn't everybody, if they, they've got a leaking valve? The, the problem is that the heart has an ability to compensate for a long period of time. So your valve can leak a lot and you feel fine. And someone tells you, well, you know, you, you need open heart surgery. And you're like, well, I feel fine. What do you mean? So that can sometimes be a, a roadblock to the therapy. But if patients are not treated in a timely fashion, again, the mortality rate is, is significantly higher. And you say, well, how often does that happen? Well, I'll just show you real quickly. We looked at uh, data from healthcare institutions across the United States. This is not Boulder data, but it is US data. And it turns out 18% of patients who have a severely leaking valve have no appointment for follow-up and no appointment for any sort of treatment. So that is a huge gap. That's almost 20% of the patients with this life-threatening condition uh, who have um, no follow-up treatment. So that's the gap, again, that I'm very interested in closing. We're using a lot of data analytics to, to do that, to understand where these people are, to understand our population, not only in Boulder, but in Colorado and the US as a whole, and understand the patients who, are, who are fall along this uh, distribution of mild, moderate to severe uh, leakage and make sure that they are, are getting um, timely treatment. We're going to do a little bit of an anatomy lesson. So, oh, you are the best. That's yeah, so awesome. Look at that. Uh -huh. Right like that. Ah, perfect. Thank you so much. So, um, so just you know, folks, you maybe some of you remember this um, from uh, from from science class in school. But I just want to get you oriented. We're going to talk about the heart, and I'm going to show you some of this stuff, uh, some live images and some drawings, to get to, just so you understand. But remember the heart, there's got two sides. The, le the right side, which is the, the venous side, that's the, the kind of the blood with no oxygen. It gets pumped to your lungs. So that blood comes from your legs and belly and all over, and from here, from your head and arms, and goes uh, into the right ventricle and then to the lungs to get oxygenated. What we're gonna talk about is a little bit, is on the left side of the heart, that's over here. This is the main pumping chamber that has all the energy that pumps the blood to your muscles and organs. All that oxygenated blood when you're out for a hike has to go through this, the left ventricle. And this is the main strong pumping chamber of the heart. The chamber has both an inflow and an outflow. And I'm gonna talk about disease of the mitral valve which is the inflow into the main pumping chamber. You can imagine if you have a problem with either one of these valves, that the heart's gonna be less efficient. We're gonna talk about uh, this particular valve tonight, the mitral valve. So this is a cross section. So if we cut someone in half this way and looked at the heart, this is a view from the top. And this is actually the front. So the breastbone would be up here. The spine would be back here. And this is the mitral valve. What, the reason I point that out it's, it's, it's sort of in the back of the heart. It's not in the front, and, um, and we'll see why that's important in terms of um, uh, the, uh, some of the pictures we'll see later on. And, I, and this valve, so I'm gonna show it in a number of different ways. Mostly I'm gonna focus on this view. Again, this is from the top. Um, from, this is the view from in the atrium looking downward. So there's the mitral valve, and this is called the surgeon's view because that's the view the surgeon gets when we look at the valve. And uh, the valve is very well understood in terms of its anatomy, it has very important uh, proportions. And when the heart is uh, contracting, 
the valve closes, and that's the valve in the closed position. When the heart relaxes, the valve opens, and that's, this is the valve in the open position as the left ventricle is filling with blood. This, just to give you one other sort of perspective on the valve here, the valve is somewhat like a parachute, if you think about it. There, it's a big sort of a canopy, and it's supported by, by strings or by cords. And as you look through the valve, you can, you can see those cords going deeper into the ventricle. And those, are the, those support the valve so that it, it maintains its normal structure and doesn't let blood or like the parachute let air leak out. You can imagine if you have a parachute and you cut one of the strings, how the, the chute will billow and the air will leak out. It's the very same thing here. If, you, if one of these strings breaks, the valve will billow and the blood leaks backwards. And so that's a problem and that's where people can get into trouble. This is just another view. This is the, the valve up here. And these are some of these strings that support it that are inside the, inside the ventricle. Lots of things can go wrong with these things. Unfortunately, these can break, they can shorten, they can contract, their, uh, these muscles can, uh, can rupture. You know, again, these are all sort of catastrophic things, but there are lots of things that can happen. And we're gonna focus a little bit on what happens if one of these strings break. Uh, and so what happens, and as I mentioned, um, is that, that valve will billow, and I think that's best shown in this example here where one of the cords is broken and now the, one of the leaflets is billowing and now the blood is going backwards. So each time the heart squeezes, it's trying to push the blood in the forward direction and instead half the blood is leaking backwards. It makes the heart much more inefficient. It has to work much harder and this can ultimately lead to heart failure. So that's, the, that's, the, that's what's at stake here. And then I'm gonna show you a little bit on how to do it. This is a little picture uh, and this is a little bit harder to see, but, but when, when you have something torn, for example, in this segment of the valve, which is a common place for it to tear, that, that little segment then billows. And the surgical operation, you guys should be able to do the operation when we're done tonight, by the way. The, uh, we, what, basically what we do is get access to the heart, and then we cut that piece out of the, of the leaflet and sew it back together. It's really just that simple. Um, there's a little bit more to it than that, but getting there is half the battle. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. So that's kind of what happens, and I'll show you this a couple different ways, but I'll show you this, some pictures of this inside the, the human heart. So again, the torn cord, the billowing of the posterior leaflet here, you can see kind of the frayed leaflets there, then we'll, we cut this segment out, sew it back together, and then reinforce it with a ring, and we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about how that works. Um, let me keep getting this. Here we go. Well, how do you get access to the valve, right? It's deep in the chest. There are a couple different ways, and, and I'll just go through them real quickly. Um, you know, the standard operation, when people say, standard, you're just gonna have a standard operation, that's a sternotomy, right? That's a saw through the breastbone uh, down the midline, which uh, is very safe, a lot less painful than people think, but it is the number one barrier to people. Um, you know, they're very much afraid of this. Um, but uh, in general, as a surgeon, I can tell you this heals very well. It's not nearly as bad as people think. But sternotomy, that's the standard operation. There's another way to do it too, uh, called sort of a mini mitral access. That's done through what's called a thoracotomy. It's an incision on the side here. Go between the ribs, spread the ribs, and uh, that's actually more painful, but it's maybe cosmetically for some people a little more attractive. My, my preferred approach is using this uh, robotic approach or endoscopic. We do it with the scope and we don't have to cut any bones and we don't have to cut any muscles and that really uh, facilitates recovery and it also gives a great, um, a great view of the valve and you'll, you'll see that in a moment. So I wanna just uh, t walk through a case with you. This is a, um, a patient uh, who, was, who was seen in our, in our clinic back in 2017. It's a 40 year old lady and I don't see her here. No, good, all right. So this is a 40 year old woman who was seen by, had a murmur and was seen by her doctor and had kind of moderately severe leak of the mitral valve, which was concerning. She was doing pretty well. The doctor wanted to see her back, but for some reason, she didn't come. Uh, and, and when you ask her, it's, she said, because she feels fine. Um, and so she, and this year, she went up to elevation, got profoundly short of breath, came back down, did not get better, and was actually admitted to the hospital in uh, congestive heart failure. <clears throat> so this is exactly what we're trying to avoid. Once you've had an episode of heart failure, uh, that's bad, obviously, and uh, 
and, and we want to avoid that for lots of reasons. She then underwent an echocardiogram, so I'm going to show you some more pictures here. These are, this is, you know, your doctor may or may not show you these sometime, but this is what you get when you get an echocardiogram. And I'm going to show you, um, let's just do this, just for, just to get you oriented. This is that main, kind of like the model, the model I showed you. This is the left ventricle. It's the main pumping chamber, right? This is the inflow. This is the left atrium. It goes through the mitral valve, which is right here. Blood goes in here, and it's supposed to go out the aorta right there. So, you know, what you'll see is, and I'll stop this in a minute to just show you, but this is the torn leaflet right here. Let's see if we can, yeah, I can stop that right like that. And this leaflet, this is all abnormal. It should be two leaflets that look pretty much like this, one here and one here, but this thing is flopping around. Um, like nobody's business, and that is a big bad problem. So that's that the torn cords, the prolapsing of the of the valve. I'll show you another another view of it. This is just kind of a reverse image of the same thing, um, but again, here's the anterior leaflet. That's normal. This thing has got a piece flying up here, and here this is all all that's abnormal. That's the prolapsing segment of the valve. And when the valve leaks like that, so this is. Again, just to get you oriented, this is the inflow. Here's the main pumping chamber, and the blood uh, uh, should go out this way. Instead, what you're going to see is when the heart squeezes, the blood gets sh shoots back into the left atrium there, and it makes a big, colorful picture. All this yellow going backwards, and you got to take my word for it, but all this yellow going backwards is an enormous amount of blood going absolutely the wrong direction. So this is, confirms the patient's diagnosis of severe mitral regurgitation. So having said that, uh, because she's had heart failure, because she's having symptoms, because this leak is so badly, she's going to um, go ahead and have an operation to fix this. The next step is a coronary angiogram. So this is to look at, in preparation for surgery, uh, to look at the arteries that supply the heart muscle itself. And I'll just show you these pictures. They're, they're beautiful. It's a nice 40-year-old. Uh, this is the injection of the right coronary artery. It's just big and juicy, smooth and open, like like uh, we all uh, hope to have. And, um, and then if you look at the next picture, she has, this is the injection on the left side. And this is just a little bit, we'll see here. And here's another picture. This is the left, left system of the arteries that supply the heart. These are all totally normal. Um, so we don't think this is contributing in any way to her problem. I think the, the, the issue that she had was really just a weakness in one of those little cords. But sometimes people can get the same problem if they've got bad disease in the arteries uh, of their heart. So we always check that ahead of time. And then one last uh, picture here. And what I'm going to show you here is this is an injection in that left ventricle. And again, I can, I'll sh you probably are going, what's, what's normal, what's not? This, all this is filling of the left ventricle. That's all normal. This should be uh, that black dye is really the, it's like, is the blood with some dye in it. And it should just go out the aorta and all over your body. But instead, what's happening is back here, there's a round thing. That's the atrium. And these, if you look real carefully, there's some blood vessels right here kind of fanning out. Those are the pulmonary veins. So what's happening is the blood, instead of going out her aorta, some of it is, a lot of it's going backwards into her lungs, causing this congestive heart failure. So anyway, this is a, it's a very, it's a very severe case and uh, definitely um, in need of, of repair. So we talked about a little bit about how to get at the valve, incisions. This is our, our approach now. We um, do this with a scope. And so you can see here, this is, uh, we do a lot of careful planning. The camera is gonna go in here. This is done from the right side of the chest. You might say, well, the heart's on the left. Why do you go on the right? And the reason is that uh, access to the, to the left atrium is best achieved from the right side. So, and it's, so we put a camera in here, and then there's some working arms for this, uh, for this, for the Da Vinci robotic system that go through little ports. They're seven millimeters to ten millimeters in size. Little puncture holes here, here. Some people, you can have your gallbladder taken out the same way, right? So, puncture here, puncture here, puncture here. Uh, and, uh, there's another arm for the robotic system. There's a little working port here. This is to get sutures and needles and things through there. And then there's a clamp that goes on the aorta that goes through a puncture in the in the axilla, and when you, when you put all those pieces in, it kind of looks like this. 
Uh, so these are the working instruments and, and the port. So this is the approach that we use most commonly. And I'm gonna switch to show you this, show you what I see when we're, when we're doing this operation. This is where I might need a little help. Um, yeah, there we go. Okay, great. So this is if you don't like blood, this is a good time to uh, check your email. Um, so this is a view with the scope from the right side of the chest looking at the, at the pericardium. Remember the heart's in a sac. The sac is called the pericardium. This is the phrenic nerve, by the way, that controls your diaphragm. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna walk through just a few of these images so that you can understand what the, what the surgeon sees uh, during an operation like this. So here we go. And I sped this up. This is, uh, it's about 18 minutes, but we're gonna just look at a few segments. And I sped it up so that it, it looks a little better. So you can tell it's sped up because the heart's beating fast. Um, so we open the pericardium. And this is a little <clears throat> um, sort of a, a device that sort of cuts and coagulates at the same time. Staying away from this nerve, remember that's a phrenic nerve. That's why I go to school for a long time. So you know that stuff, stay away from there. Uh, so we open the pericardium and what you'll see here is this is the aorta. So the aorta is the big blood vessel that comes high pressure blood vessel that comes off the top of your heart and, um, and pumps to all over your body, right? This is the, this is this little bit here is called the right atrium. And just getting ready, we have to separate some of these major vessels. The aorta, this is the right main pulmonary artery. We have to separate that, so a little dissection going on between there, get those vessels apart so we can put a clamp on there. You don't wanna put a hole in either one of those, that's a bad, that's a bad day for everybody. Um, <clears throat> so let me just move along here. So this is kind of the, a little bit in the, the preparation. We're gonna, in, we're gonna infuse the heart with a cold solution to stop it, because we gotta stop the heart to open it up. So I put, this is called a purse string suture and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's sewing in the aorta, a purse string so that when you take the, when you pull a needle out, you can tie the purse string and the hole closes. We don't pull the needle out, then think about closing it. We think about closing it before we put the needle in. That's very, uh, very important. Uh, so you can see this is, this is the needle coming in here. Some of this is, uh, that's coming in through a, through a puncture in the, in the chest wall. It's got a little cover on it. And there's the needle coming in there. And we're gonna poke that into the aorta. Yeah, it's, it's I really enjoy my work, it's great. There's not a lot of people that can poke holes in the heart for a living um, and make it better. And then it's better at the end. So anyway, this is the, we're gonna flush the heart with this solution. I'm gonna just move ahead here a little bit. Um, well, here we go. So I can show you the, so we're gonna, we're gonna put a clamp in now. There comes the clamp. We're gonna clamp the aorta so it's isolated from the circulation. The patient's now on the heart-lung machine through some uh, catheters put in through the groin. So we're gonna clamp the aorta flush the heart with this cold solution and the heart stops. And you'll see that in just a moment. And you can watch by, you can see that slowing down and now it's not moving anymore. You'll remember that the, the, the valve is in the back. So we have to, we're gonna be working down here. So we gotta lift some of this stuff out of the way. So we put a little stitch in here and we're gonna lift, lift things out of the way so we can see what we need to see. But this device, you know, just, I'll just pause for a minute to talk about the device. You can see these instruments moving. I'm controlling them from the side of the table, sitting at a console. I don't have a lot of those pictures in here, but um, maybe next time we'll, 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 we'll have an opportunity to show a little bit more of that. So now we're gonna open the left atrium. So we're gonna we lift that piece up and we open the, we're looking towards the back of the heart here now. And we're gonna open up the, that chamber, the left atrium and and now it's open. So there's a hole in there. And we're gonna make that bigger. We're gonna put some retractors in and get a good look at the valve. So that's, the, that's what's coming next here. And just to kind of, for the sake of time, because I know there's a Broncos game tonight, and I wanna I want get you guys there in time. So in comes this retractor. Again, I can control this remotely. This hole in the heart here is about mm, an inch or an inch and a half long. It's rather small. Uh, 
but I guess if it's a hole in your heart, that might be big. Uh, seems small to me. Uh, so th then we're going to get a look at the valve here, and what you can see is we're just kind of getting everything. I uh, want to get a really good view. This is actually a um, much better view with the scope here than you can get even if you have the chest wide open. So I really like this. I can see exactly what I need to see. And this is just a, uh, we've got a, a drain in there to kind of keep keep the blood out of the way. But now I'm going to look for that torn piece here. We're going to look right down here and you'll see right there. Look at all those torn, torn cords. Just like in the picture, they were flopping around. That is exactly what we expected to find. Um, and that piece has to come out. So I'm taking some measurements here. This thing is four millimeters long. There's some, there is some calculation and things that you have to do to make sure you take out just the bad piece and you've got the right amount of material to put everything back together. So that's, um, so that's what's going on there. I'm making some marks on there to make sure we've got a good, um, uh, good landmarks. And then uh, ultimately we just cut this out. And let's see what the, yep, see there's the scissors, chop, chop, chop. That's all coming out. All right, and there it is, that's the piece. I'll show you that piece later. Um, but that's how that uh, works. So then, we got, remember we gotta sew that back together. So we change instruments, we gotta put a needle in there and such, and there's a little, and there's some cutting and sewing here, going, there's some sewing going on here. So now we sew those leaflets back together. And the tissue is, is actually pretty, fairly strong and fairly flexible, unless um, there's calcium deposits, and that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a game changer. And, and if there's a lot of calcium deposit, you, you can't really, um, then you have to replace the valve. But this is gonna be repaired because the tissues are great. All the other parts are good, so uh, we sew this up through, uh, through those little holes using the instrument. And um, I mean, you probably all, some of you probably know how to sew, I'm guessing. So we just um, sew that all up. And then there's a period here where I actually sew this in two layers. So that's the second layer going in. Everything that's important gets reinforced. So we sew that bit back up. And now I'm testing it just to see if it, uh, if, uh, how, uh, if it leaks or if it's repaired. And actually, that, that looks pretty good. The next step is we reinforce the whole circle around the valve with a ring. So we're going to sew a ring in that kind of keeps, protects, takes the tension off those sutures and kind of tightens the valve up a little bit. And I'll, I'll show you that part here. I'm just putting some stitches around the valve, around the edge of the valve, and then, and there's all, all of a sudden a lot of strings, huh? So once we get the sutures around the valve, we put them through this ring. The ring gets seated around the, um, valve itself and then we'll have um, and then we'll be pretty much done there's the ring and there's we, we I guess we, we, we telescope that in and now uh, it's it's being uh, secured in place with these little clips operations almost done family's getting anxious so we've got to keep things moving and uh, now we're testing it again we'll just put some fluid in there and that is perfect that's exactly the way it's supposed to look like they call it the French smile, because it's kind of a crooked smile. Then we got to close the atrium, and, uh, and then we're all done. So, and uh, we'll just skip ahead. Closing the atrium is not that exciting. Okay, so anyway, that's, that's how it's done with the scope, and that's what it looks like. We're going to go back to the, um, we'll go back to the, to this guy here. So using these, using these devices, we can uh, do the whole thing through, um, through a scope. Here's that piece I took out. Looks just like it did on the echocardiogram, just like it did in the operating room. Here's these torn cords. You can see the size here. This is centimeters. You know, it's, I don't know, centimeter and a half or so. A fairly big piece. And then while the patient's still asleep in the operating room, we, uh, do, we echo again. And again, this is a little different view with the inflow coming here, the main pumping chamber, the blood is all going this way. There's no blood leaking back, so that's, uh, that's fixed. 
and the patient uh, home in uh, two days. And this is what it looks like 10 days afterward. This is the only incision, and it's under her arm, essentially. And it's about the size of an incision for taking out your appendix. Uh, so anyway, um, a quick recovery. And one of the questions I get very commonly from, from patients is, you know, well, I know I got this leaking valve, and I know it's bad, but I feel fine. Like, when, when should I? If the, you know, when should I do it? When should I have my operation? And my answer is usually we should start planning it now um, because I, I think these things should be dealt with in weeks, measured in weeks, not months. And the reason is if you look at the survival of patients, if their heart function starts to decline, uh, it changes dramatically. So oftentimes we talk about how strong is your heart? What is your we use a, something called ejection fraction. And ejection fraction is normal in a, when it's about 55 to 60% or higher. So if you treat patients with this condition and, um, and, and their heart function is normal, here's the survival. But if it's off just a little bit, survival drops off dramatically. And if it's poor, you can see Again, 10-year survival uh, drops off dramatically. So it's really important to get this fixed while your heart is still strong, even if you feel okay, because there are many people walking around, their heart is compensating for this leak, they feel fine, but the heart itself is working so hard, it's in this decline mode. So uh, timing is, is, really, uh, is really important uh, to get a good long-term result. And in fact, I was, just, uh, I was reading over the weekend, if the if you have a severe leak in your mitral valve uh, and you fast forward 10 years, 90% of the people will either have had an operation or be dead. So it's that critical, it's, uh, it's that critical. Um, so you can avoid an operation, the point is you can avoid an operation, but it's the hard way. Um, uh, so uh, just to talk a little bit about um, uh, people ask about well, how, many, how many cases have you done and this and that. Isolated mitral valve um, prolapse is a fairly rare condition. My, I have about 700 uh, robotic cases in my career out of 6,000. I think that's like 12% or something. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a small fraction. I mean, these other cases are other kinds of valve work, but with the robot, yeah, I've done mitral valve, tricuspid valve, closed holes in the heart, put on pacing systems, done bypass surgery, tumor resection. There's a lot of things that you can do. This uh, really is focused today on, um, on mitral valve repair. And it, in my previous uh, career in, in Wisconsin, uh, I did 150 cases with a single death uh, mortality rate of less than 1%. Uh, we've started the program here in Boulder in February. We've done 10 cases uh, with, with no mortality. And interestingly, with 10 cases, that makes us the biggest robotic center in the state. Um, I can tell you that the time on the robot system is about two to two and a half hours. The total surgical time is longer because getting the patient prepped and getting them out of the room you know, adds a, an hour on each side but about two to two and a half hours uh, of operating with the, with the robot. Hospital stay, two days. Uh, repair rate uh, has been 100% with no strokes, no deaths, and uh, return to work in 10 days. We just, I just operated on a professional wrestler. He's retired. Uh, he came to us from Florida, uh, and he um, was back in the gym on day 10. I, I saw him uh, two weeks afterward. I'm like, how are things going? He's like, oh, I've been working out for four days. I'm like, oh. So, uh, so anyway, it does, it does uh, for selected patients, it really does uh, accelerate recovery. So, you know, so the, I guess the, if I had one message to communicate tonight, it's that surgery, nobody wants to have an operation, nobody wants to have heart surgery, but without it, this condition is very um, fatal. And if, if you look at, um, this is a quote from again from the New England Journal of Medicine, that patients with severe mitral regurgitation have a significantly increased risk of death and cardiac events, that's heart failure, heart rhythm problems, and should promptly be considered for cardiac surgery since surgery reduces the rate of death from cardiac causes, decreases the risk of heart failure, and normalizes life expectancy. So, so it is important, nobody wants to have it. The good news is, 
uh, for a lot of patients now, we can do the whole thing without having to open the chest. And with that, I think we'll pause and uh, take some questions. Uh, right. So, uh, fortunately, there's enough tissue so that when you take a Excuse segment me? out, you can... Excuse me? Can you... Sure, sure. The question is... Uh, uh, Sorry, we're just going to take uh, questions at the microphone so everyone can hear them. But you can uh, obviously repeat this question, but everyone can stand up and sure. go to either side. No, the, the question was... I saw you remove a piece, but I didn't see you put a piece back in on the mitral valve. And the, and the reason for that is there's enough tissue there that you can, you can take that segment out and put the two edges together without needing to add anything uh, back. Uh, no, I just took part of one of them. So the middle part of the posterior leaflet is all that came out. Correct. Uh, go ahead. Oh. Oh, so the question was, so you took that segment out, put the pieces in, and then put a ring around it, and the leak is gone. And the answer is yes. So, go ahead. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, a quick one. You mentioned uh, the fact that you could discover uh, calcium deposits. Are those detectable before surgery? So the question is, uh, Calcium being a limitation for this, is that detectable before surgery? And the answer is almost always, almost always. Okay, and my second question is, what's the difference between, uh, if you have a micro valve or mitral valve prolapse, is that always an indication that you're having a backflow or leakage, or is that sometimes more or less a benign situation, and how often? How, what percentage of the population has mitral valve prolapses? Sure, well, mitral valve prolapse is actually uh, fairly common. I, I'd have to, I'd be estimating to give you a, a percentage in the population, but it is, it's a small but uh, significant um, number of people. And, the, and you can have prolapse of the valve without a bad leak. And I think that's what you're referring to. There are, there are folks who walk around who have some prolapse but it, it's not leaking or not leaking much, and you can live a long time with that. But those folks are at risk for you know, a more severe condition later in life. And when the, and, um, and when the, so the prolapse is really the movement of the leaflet, but when that gets bad enough, the, the blood starts going backwards, that's when you're in trouble, yeah. So in other words, that's, that's also a candidate for the surgery then? Yeah, so mitral valve prolapse, so the question is, is that, are you a candidate for a surgery, you're a candidate when you have a, the leak is bad. A little prolapse by itself is not an indication. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, on the left. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, I'm curious, are you suggesting that this robotic procedure um, allows you to repair the mitral valve in every case, or are there also cases where replacement is necessary? Sure. Uh, no, it's a great question. Um, so we use the, the robotic system for repair or replacement. Um, the ability to repair the valve is really not impacted by the device. The operation, what happens to the valve is exactly the same whether you're wide open or with the robot. The techniques are the same. And, um, and the ability is really, uh, it's the same either way. Um, is, is that what you're asking? Uh so it sounds like in some, in some cases, you actually have to replace the valve with yes. um, like either a cow or, or, or a, a pig uh, valve. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And, and do you know in advance which, what the case is, whether you're going to be able to repair or replace? You, about 95% of the time. So we plan. Uh, so I can, if I see the echo, so these patients, you know, that we do this for are highly selected uh, because I've met them examined them, looked at all their studies, and I, and I can determine that there's a greater than 95% chance that we can repair the valve. So we know a lot of that ahead of time. There are some things, the gentleman mentioned calcium earlier, there can be some things that will interfere with the repair, um, so that uh, once you get in there and you put it together, there's still some leak that can necessitate um, 
replacement, but it's very uncommon, very uncommon. Yes? Um, if a patient has a, knows they have a 40% leak uh, through their congestive heart failure or cardiologist, what determines when invasive surgery needs to be done? Right, so, um, so usually, um, I'm just trying to, to in, interpret your question a little bit. So 40% leak, uh, so generally we don't use that exact measurement, but the, the, to answer your question, if, you have, if your mitral regurgitation is graded as severe, and there's a lot of different ways to measure that, that's an indication for surgery, unless there are other mitigating factors, um, other diseases or illnesses that would significantly increase the risk. Uh, and some patients are, are too, either too elderly or too frail to have surgery. Uh, that can happen. But in general, if, it's, if, your, uh, if your leak is severe, that's an indication for an operation. If the leak is presently being controlled by adjustment in medication at the present time, and this patient is uh, frequently seeing the cardiologist, um, is that a time to ask for a referral to you to review that particular case, or does the cardiologist make that decision? That's a great question. So, most commonly, the cardiologist will identify the leak and then and will refer the patient to the surgeon with the, with the view that the surgeon's gonna look and, and see if the patient can have an operation to fix that. Um, so, so generally, that's, that's how things go. Now, I think another important point that you're, I think you're, you're, that you're kind of uh, on the edge of or, or trying to make, you know, second opinion, I think, is really important. I think, you know, if, you're, if you have one of these conditions, listen, this is like, um, it's like cancer. I mean, if you had a, a, a lump in your breast and it was breast cancer, but you felt fine, you'd probably still have it taken care of. Why? Because we know that people die from that. The mortality risk from this kind of a problem is akin to some uh, cancers. So second opinions are, I encourage them, yeah. So along the same lines, is there a downside to getting uh, this treated pre you know, too early, like if you had mild or moderate regurgitation? Um, yes. And the, down, and the downside is that you know, there's risk to the operation. You know, the operation does have risk. The results are great, but, the, but there's, it's an operation, it's heart surgery. And the risk to you, to, to the patient, for a mild leak is relatively small, so we don't generally intervene. It's when the leak becomes severe that the, the risk of the operation, uh, the risk of the condition outweighs the risk of the operation. So say it was moderate, um, would, you, would this prevent it from ever becoming severe, or is there a chance for continued degeneration? Yeah, well it does, the, it is a progressive disease, so if you have a moderate leak, you should be under surveillance, um, being seen, it, annually in most cases. I, I meant if you got it fixed, would you then prevent it progressing? Uh, theoretically, depending on the cause, uh, yes. Okay. So uh, I heard of a patient who uh, uh, went to a doctor and the doctor suggested repairing the, the, the valves, the, the, the strings, the heart strings, rather than cutting out and replacing that. Would you comment on why you choose not to go that way and what the advantages or disadvantages of the two methods are? Yeah, so the techniques that I use, I've adopted the techniques of a surgeon named Alain Carpentier, who's a French surgeon who has really done uh, the landmark work on, on uh, mitral valve repair. There have been, there are actually a lot of different ways to do it. Um, the difficulty um, that, that replacing the cords, uh, there's a couple things. One is uh, the patients who, who have this uh, condition often have a defect in the, uh, in the fibroelastic component of those cords, so they're inherently weak. And so, um, so I remove them and, and don't replace them. You can put a, put a cord back in. It's a little less reliable, unfortunately, because it takes uh, time to measure, uh, uh, put them in place, then test it. And if you made a measurement 
mistake in measurement, you gotta do it over again. And that adds time to the operation. You know, we talked about two to four hours for surgery. Uh, all those minutes count. And if you've gotta stop the heart, and then you restart it and you made your cord too long, uh, or, you didn't take, or you didn't put enough of them in, then you gotta stop the heart again. Now you've changed the whole, the whole dynamic. So the, the short answer is yes, there is a, there, that can be done, and I have done that, but I've not adopted those techniques uh, broadly because I think they're less reliable. Yes. I'm curious about um, the, the, uh, sta the state of the procedures, whether um, the procedures to correct mitral valve issues um, are, continue to evolve and advance, or whether, in your opinion, uh, they're fairly stable and, um, and you know, unchanging. And, and the reason I ask the question, just to put it in context, is um, is there, perhaps with the exception of people that have um, a severe regurgitation, is there value in waiting for additional improvement in the procedures? Right, so that's a good question. There are some patients who present with a leaking valve who have a leak for reasons other than a torn cord or a stretched cord. Those things can be related to heart rhythm. They can be related to a recent heart attack. Um, it can be related to blood pressure, uh, heart rate uh, abnormalities. So there are a number of things that can impact that. Those all have to be accounted for. Um, and for example, uh, there are some patients who develop uh, a discoordination, if you will, of the two sides of their heart. So normally, you know, the, the right and left side of the heart are coordinated. If you have a rhythm disturbance where they're out of sync, that can affect the valve and make it, make it leak. In those people, a pacemaker will resynchronize the heart and can make the leak a lot better. Um, those are, it's a different, it's a little different condition, but you're right, there are, there are situations in which uh, the leak can be what we call functional, um, meaning that it's leaking because of some other reason other than uh, a mechanical problem with the, with the valve. Back to um, the kind of the are, are the are the procedures such as the one you showed earlier? Is that um, a fairly like has that been optimized? Are there you know ongoing improvements in these procedures that might cause a patient to say, well, what if I wait a few years yeah. or yeah. perhaps more to see how that technology yeah. advances? Yeah, that's so. Waiting with this condition is a bad idea. Those are the, some of the uh, figures I showed you. It's linked with mortality, stroke, heart failure, heart rhythm disturbances. There's a number of reasons why waiting is bad. Um, and, you know, and I've been involved in the clinical trials for mitral valve de devices for the last 15 years. I've seen them all evolve. In fact, the most recent one, device called Intrepid, uh, that Medtronic's developing, I put the first one in, in the clinical trial in, in the world. And uh, there are, they are, but they're, these are interesting and some of them are very promising, but they're not time tested. And so that makes a big difference. The other thing I would point out is the, there's only one solution that's been shown to extend life. There are a number of things we can do to make the symptoms a little bit better, but they don't return you to a normal survival. And surgical mitral valve repair is the only uh, technique that returns patients to a normal life expectancy. So that's an important differentiator. Okay. If I could just have one more question, um, sure. I think it's fairly quick. But but um, the um, if if the regurgitation would you would you make the same recommendations? Like it sounds like you're saying, you know, don't delay surgery. Are you, is that specific for if you've been diagnosed with severe uh, regurgitation, or would you say the same thing uh, if the if it's mild or moderate regurgitation? No, no, it's a very important distinction. Though, so these. Operations are not done on patients with mild or moderate mitral regurgitation. <clears throat> okay, we have an online question. And the question is, how do you know the extent of a patient's regurgitation? So it's measured on echocardiography, and I showed some of those pictures. You remember the black and white sort of moving pictures shows us the defect in the valve, and then the color, the color pictures um, show us the volume and velocity of the blood moving. So uh, those, 
um, very specific measurements can be obtained from those uh, images. And then there's a grading system. So, and uh, it's a little bit, um, it's, there are a number of factors that, go, that, are, that we use to grade it. Um, it's probably beyond the scope of tonight's discussion, but it's based on the echocardiogram. All right, so if we come to the end of the questions, um, I think we, have, we are going to wrap it up and say thank you to Dr. O'Hare for this great presentation. Right. This thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, please remember to fill out your evaluation sheets, those yellow ones, and you can just leave them with me at the registration desk. Thank you.